Hello, coffee people. My name is Irina Sharipova, and I'm a coffee consultant and educator. I'm a host of the podcast, Coffee Business in the Middle East, where we discuss everything related to the coffee business in the Middle East region with coffee leaders of the industry, such as business owners of the roasteries, green trading companies, cafes, and coffee professionals. In the sixth episode, I speak with Ryan Godino, the famous entrepreneur of Hugh Coffee Project, and the main one is Specialty Batch. We discuss everything related to his business model, pricing the coffee products, and the level of competition in the UAE coffee market. Hello, Ryan. Hi. Welcome to the podcast, Coffee Business in the Middle East. How are you today? Good, thank you. How are you? Good. Uh, as we are speaking about business here, I want to know a little bit about the uh, your roastery. Um, about business model mm -hmm. because you have a roastery and also you have the cafes and I think you supply your cafes right yeah. yeah so let's start with the roastery business like since scratch like how much time and money it took you at the beginning mm -hmm. and do you consider yourself successful roastery currently yeah uh, we started in 2011 uh, started just as a training facility mm. um, started with savings, bought a, a coffee machine from the US, uh, brought a new brand into Dubai, um, and we just, the first two years was just training baristas. Uh, we then got a roaster, started training roasters, um, and then 2000 and 2014, we uh, found a villa and decided to open a little coffee bar mm -hmm. and a roastery uh, in the same location. Uh, that evolved into a separate project, which is still quite successful. Um, and I've shifted operations now from behind the cafe into a big uh, facility where we roast. We sell a wide range of professional equipment. We offer uh, technical support, maintenance for a wide range of cafe equipment as well. Um, we still provide training and we supply and support around 450 cafes and restaurants around the UAE. Mm. Now, so, sounds like a successful company. Yeah. Keeps me busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm curious about the uh, roastery management mm -hmm. and because you know nowadays people just open up a roastery and supply a few friends. Mm -hmm. And we are speaking about the big company and whether it is um, consistent and more sustainable. So what differs you from small business to be like a ever successful business? I mean, I think you're defined, your success is defined by your least happy customer. Mm. Uh, so personally, I believe you, you're better off having few customers who are completely happy as opposed to hundreds of customers where you've got unhappy customers. For me, that is success because uh, growth can come from happy customers yeah you know, it's a more organic natural form of uh, developing a, a brand and a business mm -hmm. um, but yeah I mean we we have protocols in place we have quality control procedures in place to look after every single customer that uh, signs up with us mm -hmm. yeah so speaking of happiness of customers like how to maintain this one because Sometimes it happens that customers go to one roastery, then to another. Okay, you can link them with a contract, mm. but is it about the contract or? We don't have contracts. We've never had contracts. Mm. Um, we believe if a customer likes what we have to offer, <coughs> uh, and uh, in terms of the product, the consistency, and the customer service aspect, uh, there's no reason for them to go anywhere else. If they are. If they find another supplier for coffee that's 10, 15, 20 dirhams cheaper, um, and they leave because of that, uh, for me, it's not a big deal. You know, At the end of the day, we have customers who value what we have to offer, mm -hmm. and uh, we want to grow with them. Mm -hmm. Do you help somehow to your customers, like to have a special discount and offer for the machine or some? We Spare treat details. our coffee and equipment uh, as two separate divisions. So we supply equipment uh, to lots of other roasters as well. Mm -hmm. um, we provide technical support based on the machine sales. So we support um, other roasters with that aspect as well. Um, we have programs where customers who've purchased a machine from us, uh, we, don't, we don't push coffee on them by mm -hmm. any means. 
if they like our coffee and they like uh, uh, um, you know what we stand for, they will work with us. But uh, we don't have sales agents going out there and handing out samples. That's not how we operate. Um, we have customers who use our machines and use our coffees, and they find the benefit of that sort of an arrangement because they have uh, a one point of contact for every single thing they need to, to, to run their business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also about the clients of coffee. To me, it seems very tricky here because of the competition. It's very tight. So I think, how would you evaluate your uh, client uh, data base? Like you're stick with the more loyal customers or you gain more who just uh, order coffee for a few months and then? It, that's a tricky thing. And I mean, that's tricky for any business, really. Uh, loyalty needs to be earned. Like yeah. it's not something that happens overnight. Uh, we base a lot of our relationships and growing our business through um, personality. Like we, we, we sit down with a customer potential customer and see if our ethics align mm -hmm. uh, and I, I mean I've I've turned down uh, supply arrangements because for me maybe our ethos or our ethics weren't aligned mm -hmm. for me it's not about short-term business it's more about the long-term vision uh, building a brand that can be respected that can be admired um, and that that has a, a track record of consistency mm -hmm. so but how would you evaluate your uh, clients? You have like, let's say 70% of loyal customers who is, has been buying coffee like five years mm -hmm. and you have less percentage. We have, we have customers that have been with us for nine years now. Yeah, wow. Um, and again, without any contracts. Uh, we, we don't have any sort of bias or any, any protocol when it comes to dealing with new clients or, or just you know, it's being, giving more attention to the loyal customers. If we get a new customer on board, we have a standard procedure that every one of them gets a visit from us mm -hmm. and our QC team every two weeks. Okay. Um, and that would be simple things like uh, checking their, their calibration, uh, dropping off samples mm -hmm. um, of any <coughs> new coffees that we receive, and just a general chat. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, I mean, it's manageable when you have manageable. a number that you are <laughs> not growing exponentially. It's it's when you've got systems in place, you've got an infrastructure that can accommodate your number of clients. And I think that's the difference between growing too fast, too quick, and growing mm. at a very sustainable pace. Uh, you're growing like on average uh, flow. Would you consider? Well, or? we've we've had quite a few inquiries, uh, uh, people wanting to do business with us over the last um, year, year and a half now. Um, people, and we've had lots of customers that have left us, that mm. called us again and said, you know, we want to work with you again. And to me, that's, that's a testament to our track record. Um, sometimes, you know, you have to ask them, was it worth leaving us for that 10 dirhams or 15 dirhams? Because your business essentially runs the risk of an inconsistent product or, 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 or um, subpar support systems. And at the end of the day, the cafe and restaurant business is about consistency. You have a good quality product, but then you execute it with consistency and amazing service. And that's really the, the, the key ingredient to success. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. So you have the team who maintain this. And also, I think you have like the values of the company specialty badge, mm -hmm. right? So do you have like a list of rules, like how, like tone of voice, let's say, and everything? We don't have, we don't run that sort of a ship, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. specialty badge. We, you know, we treat every customer as, as sort of our family. So we have conversations with them. We joke around with them. At the end of the day, if we say we're going to do something, we do it. That's probably the only rule that we have. Don't promise something and then not deliver it. Um, so our, our relationships are very cordial. Uh, they're very friendly. And I think that's sort of one of the, 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 the ways we would operate on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. But have you got any complaints within this period of time since you opened regarding quality, regarding your business, maybe some personal <laughs> look there's always going to be people who uh, 
try to sabotage or, mm. you know, at the end of the day, I am very confident in my capabilities and my product. Uh, being an owner who's actively involved and knowing every intricate detail of every aspect of our business, I can say being involved in quality control procedures, being involved in roasting, I can say that without doubt, I, can, I stand firm with what we have to offer. So whenever there is questions or uh, there's, uh, you know, someone says something, I'm going to be the one that goes out there to try and get to the bottom of what the issue is. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, not, you know, it's, it's about how you deal with something that comes up. If there's something that, that left our roastery that was subpar uh, for some reason, it's about how we recover from that. Um, I can say we haven't really had any big issues. Uh, we've had a, a, a few instances where uh, coffee was left out in the sun um, in one of the delivery vehicles, but that was rectified before it got to the actual client. Uh, sorry, before it got into the actual hopper of the client. Um, but no, we've never really had, had any issues in the last uh, 10, 12 years, yeah. Wow, this was a decade <laughs> of business. Yeah, so to to me, you seem like very uh, easy in a way you talk about business, but you do lots of things mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. Do you think like you're uh, taking over too much or you just it's your uh, personal trait to be involved, as you s just said, like in every part of your business, because you are responsible, yeah. you are a visionary yeah. and you're a face of your company. And without you, it's not gonna work out <laughs> look with the cafe side of things we've got 45 staff yeah um, and some of them are extremely competent they know exactly what they're doing they know a lot of things that I wouldn't have a clue about um, and you know we have staff that have been with us in the cafe for about eight nine years as well um, and you know for, for us it's like a family mm. um, I think it's about balance everything in my life is balance whether you know we're talking about extracting coffee or we're talking about actual work um, being able to, to to sort of have mini breaks in life to to gather your thoughts and and refocus and you know get back on track that's quite vital as well and we're all on uh, we're all here for a short time you know <laughs> life is so true short. there's certain true. things that you learn not to stress out about there's certain things that you stress out too much about that aren't worth it um and then there's certain things that could just be easily resolved with a clear mind and i yeah. think having that attitude um really helps wow but what made you to be like that like you thought some age <laughs> <laughs> experience yeah you know, like. look i think yeah each each passing year you just sort of realize and then we went through you know the the pandemic and then you realize so much more what 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 is really important in life mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there's certain things that you that can't be avoided there's certain things that can be avoided and prioritizing your your day-to-day -day tasks and your short-term goals um and you know your long-term vision um it's a step-by-step -step process mm -hmm. yeah. Did you have like any educational part of the business side or how did you establish the business of a roster? Uh, you started with the training center. With the training right? center, yeah. And then you switched to a uh, roastery. Cafe and roastery, yeah. Yes. How? <laughs> well, look, again, it's about the people that, uh, that, that we employ. So we, we want to work with, uh, we, we hire based on capability, we hire based on personality. And like I said, my expertise uh, in, in all these businesses is purely on the coffee, equipment, and training side of things. Uh, everything else when it comes to opera operational procedures, um, you know, uh, admin, you know, all of that, we have specialized people who do, who do that. Mm -hmm. My involvement in key decisions, like I, I make sure I'm involved in key decisions, mm -hmm. of course, when it comes to selecting suppliers, uh, new menu items, uh, launching anything, that sort of stuff. Um, but working with the right staff, treating them well, is what got me here today. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of your business, 
you were alone or you have some shareholders or investors? I don't have any investors. I don't have any partners uh, till today. And I like it that way. I, 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 there's no accountability. I don't have to report to anyone. I don't have to prove anything to anyone. Um, and at the end of the day, if I mess up, it's just on me. It's on you, yeah. Wow, you are 100% responsible. Yeah, and again, like I said, it's about balance. So I'm not growing at a pace that requires me to work 24 hours a day. I'm growing at a pace where I can still have, uh, you know, three months of solid work and then like a week or two vacation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've got a team around me that are super supportive, that are very knowledgeable, very proactive. And it's, it's just a team effort at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that you got many requests to invest in your business. Have yeah. you? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what was the reason? There's no, yeah. there's no, there's no incentive for me at this point in time to seek an investor. We don't need the capital. Uh, I don't want to be working uh, insane a number of hours or working uh, for someone else mm -hmm. <laughs> at this point in time. And I understand, you know, we could be doing a lot more, growing a lot faster if we had uh, uh, shareholders or if we had partners, but life's too short. <laughs> if, if, I'm, if I'm able to, you know, pay all the bills, look after my family, um, live a happy, comfortable life, mm -hmm. I'm happy. That's the thing, but um, not everyone, not every entrepreneur can afford to establish the business himself. Sure. And they have to have investors or the loan from mm. the bank. Mm -hmm. So how, like, what do you think, what is your point of view of this business, like to seek on the, you know, investors like as soon as possible mm. because you want to open up a roastery or a cafe? Like, does it really work? Like, personal opinion. It, it's, again, it's a very personal thing. Mm. Um, for me, I'm always of the mind that you need to grow within your means, spend within your means. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, you shouldn't take loans and you shouldn't seek investors because every individual has different wants, different desires, different, different uh, visions of where they want to be. It's a very personal thing at the end of the day. For me, it was growing at a, at a very organic pace. Mm -hmm. uh, We've never had loans as such. Everything that we've built uh, from the, the, you know, the, the, the different uh, hospitality businesses that, that, that I've got now, it's all self-funded. Wow. Um, and it's just revenue being generated, profit being generated, reinvested back into the development of each brand. Mm -hmm. Maybe it sounds like uh, very easy question, but uh, the answer will be difficult. Mm -hmm. And for uh, every business, it's a uh, different answer, I guess. Mm -hmm. But approximately, how much it takes to revenue from a roastery? Mm -hmm. If you open up a roastery, of course, it depends on the equipment, mm -hmm. right? And all of the staff. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand yes. the exact question. Like, for example, you want to open up the roastery uh -huh. and you think you will have money yeah. as quick as, as possible yeah. and people maybe they don't have any idea in how much time yeah. they will get revenue yeah do you have any idea i think they shouldn't open a business then. <laughs> <laughs> no uh, honestly if you are at that point i would like to assume that you have done a business plan that you have done your, your due diligence done research on different equipment different staff requirements uh, your demographic, who you're going to supply, but you know how you're going to earn Not revenue. everyone does it. Then that goes back to my point, then they shouldn't open a roast. <laughs> yes, that's the uh, situation in yeah. the market, actually, <laughs> honestly speaking, right? And you yeah. see that. You True. see that since... The I mean, if you've, got, if you've got a substantial amount of disposable income where, yeah, you spend half a million setting up a roastery and if you lose it, you lose it, it doesn't matter, then fine. But, I mean, it's just a waste of money at the end of the day. Uh, and it, again, it depends on what your objectives are. Yeah. Do you want some short-term gain? Like, do you want to uh, uh, build up a business and then uh, flip it, sell it, to sell it on, or uh, uh, get investors and then grow it to a, at an exponential sort of rate? Or do you want to create something that's going to 
have value um, mm. in the long term? You know, to me, here what I notice, um, there are two camps, let's say. Mm. Uh, one is people want to take over the world. Yeah. You know this, mm. I'm going to open, I'm going to take over the rest of the world. So you know these people. <laughs> the other part is they just, uh, yeah, they grow organically. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this the the business model which works well. But what do you think? Is this like the right answer for the business owner, like to not to have like imperialistic dreams and uh, grow I think organically? You have to have dreams. I think if, yeah. you, if you have dreams, it gives you some kind of a long term vision of where you want to be in 10 years, 15 years. Um, but they have to be relatively realistic based on short term visions. Mm -hmm. So you set your pace um, initially on short term goals in a bid to achieve long-term goals. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you, you know, many entrepreneurs have massive dreams, they, they, they rise, they fall, you know, they end up losing loads of money. You hear success stories of people hitting rock bottom and then making <laughs> millions later. Yeah. I think every individual is so unique, their vision is so unique, and it's, it's really about the person within you. Do you have what it takes to fall down and get up? Mm -hmm. Do you have what it takes to to, to stick it out in the long run, or do you have the right people around you who can push you on into like getting a, into building a successful brand in a very short short time? Yeah. So it's, there is there is, is no right or wrong. There is no right or wrong. I mean, it's a flip of a coin. You know, yeah. there's there's there is no right or wrong answer. There's no secret to success. <laughs> there's no you know everyone. You can be super lucky, you know, and have like a, a podcast and be super famous tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was about to ask yeah. about luckiness because some people they uh, blame to luckiness, like oh you're lucky to have this business because you're on the right time. There, I think, to my opinion, mm. there is no right time. Yeah, you either open or no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, can, I have to say we were fortunate when you know, launching Specialty Batch because it was at the time where the market was developing. So we had time to establish our name and our brand. Um, I have to say in the current climate, if I was to do it all over again right now, I probably wouldn't be doing it. Um, Why? Because, because of the, the market is just too saturated and people have, they don't have a clear vision of what they want exactly. We have we have this expression in every episode <laughs> about <laughs> saturation. Yeah. yeah, let's speak about it uh, because this is hot topic nowadays yeah. in the Middle East, specifically in Dubai. So how come it is it is saturated or oversaturated already? <laughs> Depends which side you're looking at. So in terms of numbers of roasters, number of cafes, number of coffee shops, purely just numbers, I believe it is saturated in terms of people who know what they're doing, people who are passionate, people who are successful, I don't believe it's that saturated. Mm -hmm. The problem is the sheer number of people and brands and companies doing what they're doing now, just the number of them is enough to dilute the, the, the actual pool of uh, uh, um, professionals and dilute the knowledge mm -hmm. um, it's it, it's just going to be a very hard market to crack unless you've got some good marketing behind you you've got some good support behind you starting from scratch mm -hmm. yeah that's a very interesting topic nowadays because coffee mm. it's very um, trendy mm. and to open up the business with coffee it's very trendy. It's yeah. what I hear, maybe because I'm in this field, but mm. you can hear it from anywhere. Like people, maybe they have mis misconception that it's easy to open and generate money. Mm. I mean, I know a lot of cafes aren't actually making money. Um, a lot of roasters aren't making money. So they just uh, exist and losing daily? I don't know how or why they you know continue running, but... Um, yeah, I, I feel there aren't enough owners actively involved in cafes, aren't enough owners actively involved in roastery operations. Um, and I think that, you know, those sort of businesses need to, need to, 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 to uh, phase out of this market. 
because once you have owners actively involved, mm -hmm. then there's there's more of a, a um, um, heart and soul behind a brand, and those are the brands that would be in the market for the long term. Yeah, that's true. So you think that uh, business owners should be at least like let's say on the ground, right? So they should be like uh, decision makers. They should know because some at this point, yeah. at this point in this market in this current climate, yes. Mm -hmm unless they have a substantial amount of budget for marketing and they're creating a franchise or a brand that is going to go beyond them as a person um, to be profitable to be relevant in this current market and you know being as saturated as it is i think they need to be actively involved yeah i agree um regarding your business and prices to your product how do you, what methods do you use for pricing coffee? Do you think you're on average level or you have like a special price? Like, what is this? We are, we're relatively average. In a few cases, we're actually above the average in terms of pricing. Mm -hmm. And I stand behind our pricing because I bring a substantial amount of experience, knowledge on in the coffee side of things yeah. as well as the cafe side of things. Because I know what it takes to make a coffee bar successful. I know what it takes to make a coffee bar uh, consistent and relevant mm -hmm. in uh, in this current market, and I think having that, um, you know, having having this amount of attention to detail and this passion, dealing with other owners of cafes who, you know, I would advise them against overspending on certain equipment or, or buying coffee in excess, you know, because I'm looking after their best interests as mm -hmm. well. Um, so yeah, I have no issue saying that our coffee's uh, prices are slightly above average, but we've got uh, a substantial amount of support and after sales to, to, to back that up. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to like persuade people with uh, like fancy equipment and fancy coffees. You're just speaking of more about your knowledge, uh, expertise, and it's more about sustainability again let's right? say what makes the most successful cafe right now in the market mm -hmm. that's a tough question to answer what do you think would make a cafe successful and now i'm not talking a, a new cafe just opens three months yeah they're super successful every cafe that opens the first few months they're always yeah. successful because people love to try new things yeah for me success comes with time you have to prove who you are what you have to offer to your customers that come in for the first time and that come back after a few months, come back after a few years, and they feel the same feeling they had from the first experience entering your cafe. Yeah. So, you know, everyone can import the best green coffee, roast the best That's coffee. That's <laughs> You know, you, you have to consider the entire market. Absolutely. Yeah. Specialty, as it is, specialty is a relatively small percentage of the coffee drinking culture yeah. or the coffee drinking market. Now, you take that specialty segment and you further dissect it into the nano lots, the, the super expensive, exclusive coffees. And these are coffees that aren't, from a business point of view, they aren't going to be revenue, profit generating coffees. These are merely marketing coffees yeah. that will come and go, yeah. you know. And while I always advocate for um, development of, you know, uh, at a farm level, at a processing level, uh, in terms of quality and uh, uh, development in, in uh, standards of specialty coffee, from a business point of view, you have to realize that the market for specialty hasn't grown substantially over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's growing at a very steady pace. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if you are operating a cafe or a roastery, and you want to be sustainable in the long term, you want to be profitable in the long term, you have to be realistic on what you offer. You have to be realistic on the expectations of the average coffee drinker. Um, there's, you know, the specialty coffee, it, it's its own worst enemy because people tend to close off the majority of the population because they are too consumed with this one beverage that's in front of them. They forget that there's 20 other coffee drinking people who love to drink coffee at home. They drink their Nespresso. Now they are the ones who may feel uh, inadequate 
because they don't understand the intricacies of this finely cut crafted yeah. brew. That's where the problem lies. We have to understand that you know, this is a beverage that needs to be enjoyed by all. Look at like cafe cultures that are the most popular or the most well-known in the world. Australia comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Melbourne, yeah. the coffee capital of the world. Now this country, this city, their, their, their majority of their coffee that they consume are lattes. Mm -hmm. They're not, you know, geisha uh, 90 plus. They're not, <laughs> yeah. that's a very small segment of the entire coffee drinking culture. Why are they super popular? It's because the staff know what they're doing. They know how to serve coffee. They're paid well. Mm -hmm. You know, the baristas are paid really, really well. The culture of people buying locally, ro locally roasted coffee, brewing coffee on an espresso machine that they bought locally at, you know, to brew, brew espresso at home. Because people have evolved from the franchise and the supermarket coffees into that sort of a coffee drinking culture, that's what makes the, 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 the country so well known is because they have no room for uh, major franchises. Melbourne mm. tried to open Starbucks yeah. three times and then closed down. <laughs> no. Why? Because people value the local produced uh, coffee or the local roasted coffee and the knowledge of the people that live in that country. How come they have these values? What is because here it's still coffee to me in the UE, especially, especially it's not the sustainable product, especially with the uh, let's say with paper cups, which mm. makes me you know <laughs> frustrated <laughs> because uh, the packages people, business owners, they invest a lot. Maybe I'm old fashioned, mm. but when I see these packages, uh, golden uh, paper cups, I mm. said, oh my God, what is the real price mm. for the cup of coffee? Do you really concern about cup, but not the, of course it should be nice design, but you know, sometimes it's uh, too much for the everything, mm. but coffee. Mm. Yeah, but how come the people from Australia are mm. more concerned with the local product? It's because of the ethics because, they've you know, grown with? In, I suppose, my experience in Australia is they don't sweat the, 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 the glitz and glamour. So they don't worry about, you know, this, this table has to be, you know, uh, from this place. So this light has to be this expensive. You know, those are all irrelevant things. Mm -hmm. The core of their business is their products and their yeah. service. Yeah. That's what's really built that culture. You go into like some of the best coffee houses or the most popular coffee houses, they'll have furniture that's like second hand. They they bought it at an auction. It, Nothing it makes matches. The soul of the place. Exactly right. Yeah. That's what that's 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 part of the the the, the vibe of the cafe cultures in uh, cafe culture in Australia, and the best coffee you'd have would be in a place that that you know the sofas are torn and uh, those things don't make a difference to what you're serving. Do you think it's a cultural thing here, or it, there is a room for this improvement? I think we there's, can do there's this a room here. for to achieve a better balance mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> in what you serve and who you are. Yeah. So, as a cafe, you are not defined by your furniture. You are not defined by what people see on Instagram. You are defined by how people remember you, how people talk about you as the products that you serve, the staff mm -hmm. that you have working. It's a great point, actually. It's what I noticed uh, as well on Instagram. Yeah, social media, it's a great tool. Mm. But this tool, what they show, the furniture, what do you mention? Mm. Yeah, furniture, some nice, uh, I don't know, mirrors and everything. Even though they use nice coffee, mm. specialty. Yeah. But what I've seen, maybe few cafes translate about the coffee about the, yeah. mm. i'm not speaking about like how not transparent people here mm -hmm. yeah because they normally hide the roastery <laughs> this is also for me something exotic <laughs> <laughs> so people hide this information but actually this is the part of coffee culture it's how it's supposed to be isn't mm. it like mm. you go to the coffee shop so you have to have this consciousness like about the product what you drink because Yes, maybe it depends on people, but I think people here, they can afford to get good product, but it's all about knowledge. Maybe they are not open here for the knowledge. Maybe the a cultural thing here in the coffee shop to sit in a nice place. It's also a matter of how they're getting that knowledge. Are they hearing it from baristas who have received that knowledge 
inadequately? Have they been trained properly? Uh, are they speaking the truth to the customer? Do they know the truth in yeah, the first instance? Yeah, this is another topic. So yeah. let's take the knowledge of the product out of the equation. Let's forget, let's imagine that general customers don't know about the product. They know what they like. Yeah. They taste it, they drink it, they eat it, whatever. They know what they like by the way they feel after they've consumed it. Now, that is part of the experience. The second is how they feel when they sat in your restaurant or your cafe. Was it comfortable? Was the service good? Was it, uh, 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 did they have a good time? When they left and they came back another day, that product they like, they had it again, is it the same mm -hmm. as they remembered it? Yeah. This is a part of the experience that, that, that essentially brings you back business. Mm -hmm. Everything else is irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah, true. We can, we can push our agenda of, you know, uh, um, cup of excellence coffee every day till the sun comes out. doesn't really matter. We can keep <laughs> pushing it. But we have to be realistic that it is going to always be a very small segment of the market who Absolutely. will buy it and who will continue to buy it. They may mm -hmm. buy it now, but will they come back tomorrow? Will they come back the next day and keep buying it? Can we compare that with... Um Michelin stars restaurant, because it's also not for everyone, right? Again, it's it's it's. It's not because I mean it's not about the price; it's about the uh, experience. Experience, yeah. 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 Can we consider it the same with specialty? Yeah. Do we really need that specialty is everywhere, and people try to push it and tell you, this is one thousand dirham per kilo? I mean, who's so pushing it? Most places that 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 have real, you know, that, ha that promote specialty to a high degree. You are, you, if you actually look at their books, their micro lots aren't their best sellers. It's going to be a small percentage of the overall sales. May, uh, you know, whether it's the overall sales in the month or overall sales in the year, it's going to be a relatively small number compared to the volume of sales they do. So if we're comparing it to Michelin star restaurants, again, you, me, every, the average earner, the average worker in Dubai, they may go to the Michelin star restaurant once a year, once a, every yes. six months for that experience, for a special occasion. And it's the same sense with coffee drinkers. They may try it once in a while, but it's not going to keep your business profitable. It's going to be something that attracts people once in a while to showcase something that's exceptional. But if we're talking about business, we have to offer a product that is consistent with some excellent service behind it. Mm -hmm. Do you think, uh, just in your opinion, do we need to exclude these uh, fancy coffees from coffee shop and separate these places or coffee I don't shop? Think, I don't know. I mean, everyone's going to have their own opinions on how they want to yeah. run their own business, I suppose. Mm. Um, I, don't, I don't favor one way over the other. I think if, you're, if you are going to have a really expensive cup of coffee, serve it to a guest in a non-aggressive, non-threatening, non-snobby way. Yeah. Uh, educate the customer in an uh, um, active or passive, you, you know, this is part of the customer service aspect. The staff have to understand, or the barista, head barista needs to know, does this customer in front of me want to know more information about this yeah. coffee? Is he eager to know more? Yeah. Or shall I serve him this coffee with a little bit of information on the side and wait for him to ask me questions? So I think every cafe can have something that's super exclusive, super exciting on their menu. Or they can choose to not, and they can serve, you know, the, the, the Spanish lattes and, you know, the, the blended coffees. It depends where they see their company growing or how, how they see their company moving forward. Yeah, they just need to stick to their values and yeah. the concepts. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of uh, education and trainings, um, how do you personally ensure it's in the your company with your staff so do you train them and how do you transfer the info through your sales team to your clients what is the system in your so company? i'm involved in all of our clients all of the the, the training that happens with the key staff uh, they come to our roastery and i'm involved in that training mm -hmm. uh, it, part of my job is to also see how they are absorbing information and whether they're they're whether they should be in that position. So if they're making coffee, do they have the right knowledge? Do they have the right passion to achieve that knowledge? And if they don't, 
they shouldn't be in the coffee business or they shouldn't be on the bar. So efficient and effective transfer of knowledge comes from uh, establishing their personality and growing that gradually with them. It's easy to overwhelm people with information. You, yeah. know, you can present them a massive uh, a <laughs> slideshow and at the end of the session, they're dumber than when they first came in. So it's a matter of pacing your, your, your education and then following up because nothing can be learned in one day. Nothing, nothing worthwhile, nothing sustainable can be learned in one day. Yeah. It takes time, it takes practice. And I think that's part of the process which you have to respect is pass on information, see how they absorb it, follow up and see if they're practicing what they learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Even to me, even though I'm a coffee teacher, trainer and mm -hmm. etc. I do the CCA certifications, which takes a day per level, two days per intermediate, etc. But it's more, uh, of course, it gives you some information, a useful one, and also practical side, which I really love from the ACA. But of course, when people ask me, um, um, so I will be the professional barista after your training? I said, how? No. Mm. And they ask me, how long it will take? Mm. Listen, I can give you like a proper information, Mm. Yeah, you just need to stick to standards, but the matter is to practice. Mm. You can come back to the next level yeah. and get it again. Yeah, because it, it really takes time. And also it depends on the person. Yeah. Because some I always ask those people. I ask them, what is your objective? Yeah. Like, what do you hope to take away from this class? Absolutely. If they say knowledge first or a certificate first, <laughs> then I so, sort of understand their priorities. I understand why they're there in the first place. Yeah. Um, I've, I've started being very selective about who we train or who we teach who aren't our clients. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes to me and they write to me because they want to learn about you know, brewing or roasting uh, or you know, sensory, whatever it is, I want to understand their objective for writing to me. Mm -hmm. Why come here when there's so many people doing training? And I've seen a lot of people persist with me and trying to develop, get time booked in with me after doing other trainings because mm. they haven't achieved that knowledge yeah. uh, elsewhere. So like now we're going to run a, a roasting workshop uh, end of next week and it's with one passionate individual who didn't get the knowledge he hoped to get from doing a roasting foundation and intermediate with someone else. Mm -hmm. So I told him, you know, I'm not going to call it an SEA program. You're going to teach him? Yeah, I'm going to teach him. Okay. And I'm my my role in this uh, you know this program would be to transfer the knowledge that should have been transferred in the foundation level see how you perform mm -hmm. at a foundation standard and then after time take it to an intermediate level yeah and he's very happy with that <laughs> yeah you always have to question your people but uh, as an ASD teacher now i'm thinking about like how sustainable again this uh, ACE classes first of all it's expensive mm -hmm. and also to me I got messages like ah oh, uh, Miss Irina I want to get certificate but I said uh, do you want to learn something mm -hmm. but most of the barista they think that they want to have this certificate because they think that the coffee shop they will get him because of the certificate mm. What is your uh, opinion about the SEA classes and about cost of the training? And do coffee shop owners or maybe roasters owners have to invest in their staff with this paid education? With paid training. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I think investing in their staff is, is vital if they want to be successful. They need to. They need to uh, spend money and educate their, their own staff for their own success. Um, in terms of uh, certified training, I, you know, I, was, I was the first SCAA instructor back in, you know, when coffee started in Dubai, like specialty coffee started. And like I said, the first three years was training. Um, and we, we subsidized a lot of the, uh, the training costs or certification fees for baristas who were underpaid then. Mm. Um, and when companies wanted to send groups of staff, like four or five staff, then we charged a little higher mm -hmm. and offset you know, the, the, the students who came on their own with their own money. So we didn't charge much uh, back then. Um, 
in terms of certified training, again, the market is so diluted. And it's a matter of finding the people who want this qualification for the right reasons. Uh, you know, I, I wrote an article about this on Filter Magazine about certified training and how it should be very closely governed and moderated in order for it to be relevant and valuable. Um, after I wrote that article, I got a few messages from one from Pakistan, one from Egypt, one from uh, Sweden. So this was all like within a few days of writing that article. And they expressed their feelings to encounters they had with people who came with professional level certification, intermediate level certification, who didn't possess the knowledge and skills that they should have. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to be quite a, a global issue. So it's not unique to UAE. It's, it's something that needs to be really governed and instructors need to be held accountable for the content that they're, they're providing to their, their students. Um, I think finding a good instructor is is part of the process as well. It's yeah. about getting testimonials. Um, sometimes it's not about having trained the most number of people, but you can train 10 people, but only two of them still possess the knowledge that they should have. Yeah. Whereas you can just train four people, but all of them possess that knowledge. So it's not really about the number of people you train. I think it's about the quality of people that you, you, you graduate from each program. Mm -hmm. But it's hard uh, to me to find these people here because, again, about the support from the companies, mm -hmm. not every coffee shop. Well, they, you have it, they just it all comes back down to the value of the not just the program, but the value of the, the job that they will achieve from gaining this certification. Mm -hmm. So you pay 1,800, 2,000 dirhams for a certificate that's not going to give you you know, more than 4,000 or 5,000 dirhams a month. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't seem valuable. Whereas you go to another country and you, you pay this money and you get a job that's paying 10,000, $12,000 uh, dirhams a month. Mm. It has more value because that certification is linked to a qualification that is respected. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, the industry is shooting itself in the foot because that, that, that position should be a lot higher. The, the, the pay should be a lot higher than where it is right now. That's the issue here, as we discussed earlier. Um, but how it can be resolved? Because it will be constant. I think the only way people. it'll be resolved is, like I said, owners are involved. When owners are involved in their business, they can spot talent. They can see that certain staff are performing really well within their position. I think there's a lot of inconsistencies in the market that needs to be purged. So inadequate baristas or inadequate owners or inadequate staff overall, I think a lot of these people are holding down the profession yeah. of true professionals. So if I'm putting up a job for a head barista and I get 100 CVs, oh. maybe one or two will be qualified. But as an owner, you know, I would look at certain standards, whether it's their knowledge or their personality. Most owners, most cafe owners, they will see who will accept a specific salary. You know, yeah. so Numbers they may first. disregard the really well qualified because the other 98 uh, candidates that are applying are applying, willing to accept 2,500, 3,000. So owners are gonna be like, oh, he's worked at all these cafes and he's getting this much. Fine, I'll get him because he's within my budget. So it's, mm. it, uh, it's this pool that needs, needs to be purged a little bit. Yeah, that's the reality of the market currently. What else do you think the uh, challenges in the market um, in the Middle East as a business owner for you? What are you struggling with? I think there's challenges in not just in the Middle East, in every country. I mean, you look at from in a hospitality point of view, you know, you're dealing with, you know, fierce co competition, you're dealing with customer preferences, you're dealing with evolving trends, you're dealing with um, a changing economy, changing regulations of, you know, food and, con food and safety regulations changing. So I think navigating all of that is one task, but then you ha also have to look within your company and evaluate 
where the inconsistencies lie within your company. And I think this is comes back down to the owners being actively involved. <laughs> okay. Because, I mean, look, yeah. you know, we spoke about the, the barista roaster mafia we, uh, before this uh, recording started. I've been vocal about it. Right now, the, you know, the Dubai Chamber of Commerce, they've set up a new group that's, that's put, that this is going to be one of the topics of the, the agenda is tackling this sort of an issue. But inconsistencies within your company could mean not knowing where, um, um, not knowing where your staff's allegiance lie. So if you are underpaying your barista, if you are underpaying your barista, he is most likely um, enticed to achieve, you know, receive commission from suppliers. And it's not just barista; it's, it's chefs, kitchen staff, anyone within your company who's not happy, who's not well paid will seek assistance elsewhere yeah. so it's like a little cycle that 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 needs to first be understood from all angles before it's tackled yeah absolutely right words <laughs> <laughs> could you tell us um, what is your biggest loss if you had lost anything within this decade of your business biggest People, loss. money maybe you regret about something I, mm, I don't have any regrets. I mean, I've lost money, I've lost really good stuff, but uh, that was just a selfish thing to say, I've lost stuff because they've gone on to do good things in life. Um, any financial loss that I've had, I've taken it as learning curves. So there's absolutely nothing that I really regret. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy to say, oh, I wish I did that, I wish I did this, but I'm very happy and comfortable with where I am right now. Mm. And I think everyone should be in that frame of mind. There's no point thinking too much about the past. Yeah. Think about the next few days, think about you know the next six months, think about the next year, uh, and just value all the people around you, you know, the, the people who are within your circle. Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, inevitably that you're doing mistakes. Yeah, you have to, it's how you recover. <laughs> you know, even dealing with your, your clients, you know, as a, as a roastery as a, or as a uh, cafe, you can, everyone makes mistakes. Yeah. No one can be perfect 100% of the time. But it's a matter of how you recover, how you communicate, and your ethics. I think this establishes who you are and where you're going to go. Yeah, absolutely. What is your uh, biggest achievement? biggest achievement <laughs> I think having a business that is still respected relevant in this current market I would say is probably my biggest achievement yeah wow because you have the image already and you didn't do anything wrong yeah because you well exist in many years <laughs> Everyone makes mistakes, like I said, yeah. that's how you recover. Yeah. At the end of the day, I can go home, go to bed, because, and have a great night's sleep because I know I've got some solid ethics yeah. on how I run my business, on how I treat the people around me, all the staff are treated well. Um, I have, I'm not going to have any sleepless nights worrying about stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and like I said, life's too short to worry really yeah but also um, business should be honest i mean you have to be honest in front of yourself first of all yeah yeah true be honest with yourself because <laughs> at the end of the day the truth com will come out will come out you know? absolutely and yeah. that, again that's a very short term vision if you if you are not honest or you are behaving uneth unethically it just goes more towards your character as a person as an individual forget your business it's it's about your character and the legacy you're going to leave behind. Yeah. Your character, how you lived, how you treated people around you, and how you supported others, and you supported your company, or you supported your family. Yeah, sounds wonderful. Um, you have the roastery and three cafes? Two cafes. Two cafes. Well, cafe and restaurant, Stomping Grits, and uh, Tyler's Tavern, which is a bar and restaurant. Do you see another opportunities to grow or you're fine with what you have there are opportunities and there's most likely something that's coming up uh, within the next six to twelve months wow. um, 
this one might be slightly different, slightly more interesting in terms of the, the dynamics of operations. But, um, you know, people ask us, oh, why haven't we opened more branches of stomping grounds and that sort of stuff. And again, if we did open it in different locations, we n would have needed to find partners who we were comfortable with who aligned with our ethics and our vision. And at, it just wasn't the right time so far. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's stuff underway right now. So we'll just have to see how that, uh, how that evolves over the next six months. Wow. So uh, when did you open your cafes? Uh, after you opened uh, Roastery? So the, yeah, the Roastery opened, uh, the, the training facility launched first. Like I said, we were yeah, doing yeah. all of the <coughs> training programs. The cafe and the roastery launched officially in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the roastery, we started roasting before the cafe was finished uh, for about a year and a half prior to the opening. The cafe opened in 2015, uh, and then uh, the restaurant and bar opened in 2021, end. Wow. I wish you good luck in your success. Thank you. And can you tell us at the end of the episode <clears throat> any advice for current entrepreneurs who have coffee business? I don't know if I've said this before, but be involved in your business. <laughs> <laughs> I will call this yeah. episode like that. <laughs> I think if, you, if you're opening hospitality, it's, you have to realize it's about people. And your people, your staff need to see you, need to have your presence and your personality within that cafe. So I would say if you are doing a coffee business or a cafe in Dubai or in UAE right now, spend more time, get to know your operations, study how things are done, how things are purchased, learn about your staff, learn about what makes them happy. Keep, make sure they are happy. Yeah. Make sure they're paid well because happy staff will stay with you. There's no reason for them to leave for, uh, if, they're, if they are happy and they're, they're well paid. Yeah. Wow. So with these good words, we have to wrap up. Thank you, Ryan. It was absolutely My pleasure. pleasure to me. Your words like absolutely resonating. Yes. And I agree with most of the topics. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. And thank you for having me. Yes. And it was the podcast Coffee Business in the Middle East. The best way to support our podcast is to subscribe to YouTube channel, Spotify or Apple podcast. We appreciate your support and don't forget to share this episode with your friends, colleagues and fellow coffee enthusiasts. Thank you for the listening and we'll catch you in the next one.